Great. Thank you very much for the introduction and for accepting my talk on this track. It's actually the first time I've spoken at the data engineering track at Apache. I, I have spoken at quite a few other tracks, and the last time I spoke at a European event was actually in Berlin in 2019. I don't know if anyone else was in, in the Berlin event. There's a few. Yep. So um, thank you very much. And let's get going. Um, oops, assuming the buttons will work. Hmm, interesting. Use a different button. No? No, oh, there we go. Okay, it's a slow, like me at the moment. So, um, data engineering. Um, I wondered actually when I um, heard that I'd had this talk accepted whether I really knew anything about data engineering. And I was thinking back in 2021, I actually had a chapter accepted in the book with the word data engineering in the title. So I thought, okay, that's a good thing. Um, my background is as a computer scientist for about 40 years. Um, and mainly distributed systems R&D. So I think there's a bit of an overlap potentially with data engineering. Um, this was supposed to be a custom talk. I was talking at the Kafka Summit in India a month ago, and the day I got back into Australia, I came down with a COVID-positive test, and I've been quite um, out of action, unfortunately, for a month, and I was planning on writing two brand-new talks for this conference. Um, this one, however, is one I've decided just to reuse from... Asia, which I gave in Hanoi about two months ago, and it was exactly 30 minutes long and covered 30 technologies. I've deleted one, so you've got 29, so I'm hoping 29 <laughs> is enough, and it's a, it's a very high-level um, run through all of these 29 technologies, so hold your breath. Here they are. Don't blink. Um, Apache is in the middle. There's a whole bunch of Apache technologies, plus some other open-source technologies as well. Uh, what do they have in common? Well, I work for a company called InstaCluster, which got bought out by NetApp a few years ago. We provide some of these as managed services, um, but they are all complementary and they can be used together. Um, and I've, I've learnt them all over the last seven years, so they're all new to me in the last seven years. And I've typically built realistic demo applications and blogged and talked about them. Um, a lot of what I, um, I'm interested in is sort of architectural features of these technologies, so I'm hoping that that, that is interesting as well. So in particular performance, so I actually run the performance engineering track, so if you're interested in the performance of Apache technologies, come along tomorrow for the performance engineering track as well. Um, so, okay, so this is a strange toy I found at the shop recently. It's an escaped Pokemon, I guessed. So when my kids were growing up, which is a long time ago now, um, Pokemon lived in something called a Game Boy, so this one's obviously escaped into the real world. So this gave me the idea for the format for the talk. Basically, I'll introduce the technologies, um, mention a few superpowers, things to watch out for. So, for example, Pokemon. This is the Tamanda Pokemon. It's a fire lizard. It evolves to another type of fire-breathing lizard, apparently. But it does have a weakness, which is water. So watch out. I'll add a few things like use cases and what's new for that technology as well. So, number one, okay, the order is essentially chronological. This is the order in which I've used and learnt these technologies. Apache Cassandra was the first um, service that we had as a managed service. Um, so uh, Cassandra is great for very fast writes. And I've got pictures to try and illustrate the main point of each technology. Here we have an office typing pool from a long time ago where the only way they could scale up the ability to write lots of memos and letters was to have lots of people typing. Uh, it's a no SQL horizontally scalable key value database. Um, fast writes, it's a wide column store, which is also quite useful for some things. Uh, it has clustering columns, which is good for hierarchical data modeling. Uh, for example, I found it's really great for modeling geospatial data. And it has inbuilt multi DC replication, which is great if you want a sort of a whole globally distributed low latency system. Some of the use cases that I've used it for was actually the, the talk I gave back in Berlin. Um, this was an anomaly detection system which achieved 19 billion anomaly checks a day. It's a combination of uh, a couple of technologies, primarily Cassandra and Kafka, and Kubernetes as well. Uh, I also did a demo of a, a um, low latency fintech system. So this was one where we, we essentially wanted to build, build in um, redundancy across multiple geo locations and also keep the latency down. And, Kind of worked really well for that as well. Um, things to watch out for. It's got its own um, query language, CQL, which is not SQL. Um, it's got a pretty different data model to SQL as well. You have to design it for reads. And denormalization of tables is, well, normal, in fact. 
uh, and the consistency is somewhat less than traditional SQL databases. Uh, and reads are slower because it's optimized for writes. Uh, what's new? Well, everyone's introducing vector search, and Cassandra's um, uh, doing that as well. So there's vector search coming up. That. Number two, Apache Spark. Uh, what is it? Well, it's a cluster batch stream processing system which includes analytics and machine learning, some superpowers. It's in memory, so it's really fast. It's got good support for machine learning. Um, and with, used in conjunction with Cassandra, which has the wide, wide columns, it's great as a feature store and works well together as well. So it's good for heavy transformation operations at scale. And my use cases, well, I've only really used it once from the serious application was where I did some machine learning over some of our monitoring data we had from all of our Cassandra clusters that we run. Um, so it used a combination of Spark, Cassandra, machine learning, lib data frames, and Spark streaming to try and predict when clusters would have problems uh, ahead of when the problem occurred. Um, things to watch out for. Uh, it needs lots of RAM, otherwise you get OOM errors. And Spark streaming is near real-time um, using micro-batching. It's not quite as real-time as, say, Kafka. Uh, in 3.1, it's got these new things called Spark Connect to decouple client servers. And we actually have a, a version of Spark um, um, called Ocean for, for Apache Spark, which is run on Kubernetes, which is a really quite a cool way of, of scaling it. So Spark's a bit like, I didn't mention my picture, it's a bit like an assembly line in a factory where there's a lot of things going on at once. Apache Zeppelin, this is a sort of an oldish technology, but I thought I'd mention it because it was one that I have used and talked about in the past. It's a web-based notebook for data exploration. Uh, it's an interactive notebook style tool and it supports Apache Spark pretty well. Um, you do need to watch out that you have sufficient resources for Zeppelin, and we actually don't support it as part of our managed service platform anymore, but um, Jupyter is the sort of the new kid on the block. So the Jupyter Notebook has good Kafka and Cassandra integration and seems to be the one that people are increasingly using, so have a look at that. Number four, Apache Lucene. That's one that a lot of people talk about at Apache events, and there's a whole sort of track dedicated to search in the Apache community. Um, so it's, it's sort of a mechanism for looking things up a bit like looking up something in the old-fashioned library card catalog systems. So it's a fast, full-featured search engine. Um, some of the superpowers that I think are interesting is that there's a Lucene plugin for Cassandra, which gives Cassandra enhanced search. And it works as a Cassandra secondary index and has support for vector search currently as well. Um, need to watch out for performance. Um, we currently actually support the Cassandra Lucene index, but probably not for much longer. So just that's something to keep in mind as well. My use cases, well, I, it was a slightly odd one. I was interested in doing geospatial anomaly detection. So I enhanced the um, anomaly detection system that I built to also do some spatial um, checks as well. So to do that, I use the Apache Lucene plugin, which has really good support for geospatial searches. Number five, Apache Kafka. This is perhaps the technology that I use most and find the most interesting. Um, the picture is a postal del delivery service on, on, on a train. So Kafka is a bit like a delivery postal service at that point. It's a distributed uh, pub-sub messaging system. Superpowers include being really fast, highly distributed, and horizontally scalable, available, and durable. Uh, it's, it also provides really good buffering and message replay, which is perhaps a bit different to traditional message systems. Uh, my use cases, well, I started out by building sort of a toy um, Christmas tree light simulation, uh, and that, that, that was pretty cool at work. Um, it was only a toy problem, though, so I thought, well, what other types of simulations might be interesting? So the first real application I built was essentially a simulation of a logistics delivery system where there were sort of goods being moved around by trucks um, to warehouses and you had to do real-time checking of lots of rules about what was safe to transport together and environmental factors about how you could store different goods and things like that. So it was pretty complicated and it worked quite well. Um, the anonymity detection system again actually did include Kafka as one of the main technologies. Um, Kafka was essentially the part that, that ran the anomaly detection pipeline as a Kafka client. Uh, it was using Cassandra to do persistence and to read um, data back again, but it was all the actual clever stuff was happening inside a Kafka client. 
Um, things to watch out for. Too many topics and petitions can input throughput, impact throughput. Um, what's new? Uh, KRAFT is replacing Zookeeper in the, the current versions. This gives faster metadata operations, and based on some of our internal benchmarking and the surprise, it may give faster data workloads as well, and I'm talking about that hopefully um, at Community Over Code in Denver in a few months. Uh, tiered storage is coming and it is, is sort of there already. Um, and end to end client monitoring is coming in 3.7, which should be interesting as well. Uh, there's a few related Kafka technologies I'll talk about now Apache Kafka Streams. Uh, it's a stream processing API and client for Kafka. Um, it works um, from and to the Kafka cluster. Um, it gives complex straightforward stream processing operations, for example, joins over multiple streams, uh, multiple topics, basically, um, over different time windows and multiple topics and state stores as well. So there's also state built into it as well. My use cases, um, as part of the IoT application, I also included the ability to check whether trucks were being overloaded as well. So that was all done with the stream processing API. Uh, things to watch out for. Uh, the topologies can get quite complicated. There's a tool which prints out the topology for you, and there's an example of the, the truck overload one, so it's not it's non-trivial. Debugging is tricky. You get some strange errors sometimes, which are quite hard to resolve, and performance can be an issue for Kafka streams. Uh, there are increasingly a number of alternatives in the open source community in particular, including Flink and Rising Wave, which is one I'll mention at the end. Apache Kafka Connect, number seven. Um, this is the Kafka API for streaming from the source to sync systems via a Kafka cluster. It gives you um, heterogeneous integration. It's code free. You just um, con configure the connectors and then use them and run them in the Kafka Connect cluster. Uh, it gives you independent scalability. The Kafka Connect cluster is independent to the Kafka cluster, so you can scale the connectors independent to your Kafka cluster. My use cases. Um, there was one project I did a few years ago, which is to build multiple different data pipelines using a combination of technologies that Kafka Connect was always sort of in the middle there. So this was a system designed to read um, tidal data from REST um, APIs and put the tidal data into a variety of um, sync systems, including OpenSearch and PostgreSQL, and then visualize them using different technologies. Um, things to watch out for. Uh, there's a lot of open source connectors around, so you have to evaluate and select ones that are going to be suitable for your requirements. You have to handle errors, otherwise the pipeline will fail in strange and wondrous ways. And also source and sync system scalability is something you have to take into account, so monitoring is pretty important to be able to do that. Um, Debezium is based on Kafka Connect, largely anyway, for most of the, the systems. Kafka Mirror Maker 2, number 8. Um, yep, I came by Prague here, so it's actually the 100th centenary yesterday of Kafka's death, which I didn't know, um, but I did discover the, the moving head of Kafka in Prague a few days ago. It's actually broken at the moment, it's not moving, unfortunately. Uh, Mirror Maker 2 replicates Kafka topics between different clusters. It uses Kafka Connect, um, but reads and writes from and to different Kafka clusters. Uh, it supports things like topic renaming and prevents loops, which are a problem in distributed event systems, uh, and allows complex bidirectional topologies. So there's a whole bunch of use cases um, for having multiple capture clusters, including the ability to migrate um, geographical distribution, um, fan-out architectures, and edge computing, where you just have to have your capture cluster near the, the sensors and things like that. Um, things to watch out for. Bidirectional flow requires two Kafka Connect clusters. Um, you have to watch out for duplicate events from overlapping topic subscriptions um, and use topic renaming and the default source cluster alias to prevent cycles and infinite topic creation, which are strange things you want to avoid. Um, for me, anyway, which I only just caught up with this recently, in 2020, they introduced automated consumer offset sync across clusters, which when I was investigating Mirror Maker 2 originally seemed like a really useful thing to have, but I haven't got around to trying that. I'm only four years behind. Uh, Apache Camel. This is a different Apache project. Who's, who's used Camel or is involved in Camel? There's a few. Yeah, it's a really cool Apache technology. Uh, Apache Camel is an integration framework. 
However, it's also got really great support for Kafka connectors. So the, it's a bit of an mouthful. There's the Apache Camel Kafka connectors subproject. I think I've got that right. It's a whole bunch of open source Kafka connectors. There's a very large number of open source Kafka connectors. Depending on how you count, about 172 or 179 different source and sync connectors. And the magic thing about Camel is that these are all automatically generated from the Camel component. So if there's a Camel component that is um, potentially usable as a Kafka connector, it will be automatically included in the, in the list. And you can use it. Um, you have to watch out, though, for configuration. So this has got actually more complex recently. You've got to read the documentation for the Camel component, the basic connector configuration, and the connector specific documentation, and then hope that you've got everything you need and, and that it's correct. Um, some connectors are both sources and sinks, and that depends on how you configure them. Others are quite distinct. They are only sources or only sinks. What's new? Camelettes um, is something new in, in Camel. And why is that relevant for Kafka Connect? Well, again, there's probably a fourth thing you have to read about, which is how to configure the Camelette aspects um, in the configuration file as well. So. Number 10, the Kafka Parallel Consumer. Now, this isn't really an official part of the Kafka distribution, but it's quite a useful client. It's a multi-threaded Kafka consumer. Its main ability is to have multi-threaded clients compared to the default consumers, which are only single-threaded, uh, which gives you higher concurrency with less consumers and partitions. So it's really great for low latency, high throughput clients where you've got intrinsically slow consumers. You might be communicating with some um, back-end system or having to do a lot of processing in the client, which slows the single-threaded consumer down a lot, pushes up the partition clients where great. Um, in the past, I've used multiple pools or multiple thread pools and consumers, and you don't have to do that sort of hack anymore. You could just use this. Um, things to watch out for. Um, it's got various configuration options, including the ordering mode. Um, the default is a partition, but you can also configure it for key ordering or unordered, and there's increasing concurrency from left to right there. You also have to specify the maximum threads um, for each consumer. Um, and in the new version, there's a choice of commit modes, which I haven't experimented with yet. <coughs> Number 11 and 12, we're doing two at once, Zookeeper and Curator. Who's used Zookeeper or come across Zookeeper? Okay. Yep, that's, I've talked about Zookeeper before Apache Events. Um, it's a distributed systems and coordination and metadata management system. It's used by a lot of Apache technologies. Um, it gives high consistency availability and performance, but only for reads the performance uh, for writes is a bit suboptimal. Uh, and until recently, at least, it's used in Kafka and Pulsar and quite a few other Apache projects. Um, so how did I use it? I built a sort of a demo app a few years ago which solved the dining philosophers problem, which is sort of a well-known entry-level computer science problem involving coordination of multiple things and stuff. And it worked really well for that. Um, watch out, though. It is quite low-level. And Apache Curator is actually a high-level zoo Zookeeper client and is better and provides abstractions, I think, for things like leader lap, shared locks, and shared counters. So that's what I ended up using. It's, uh, it does have limited scalability for writes, and the maximum cluster size is about seven servers. Uh, so what's new? Well, KRAFT, for Kafka anyway, is a Raft-based implementation for metadata management and leader election. It gives Kafka specifically faster metadata operations and the ability to have quite a lot more petitions, potentially millions of petitions. Um, yep, and potentially faster data workloads. Let's see how that goes. 13 Kubernetes. Um, so this is probably one that everyone's come across. It's a container application runtime environment. Um, it's available on public clouds. Ephemeral pods are the unit of concurrency and it's very easy to scale applications. Maybe too easy as I've discovered in some, some cases. So I used it, my anonymity detection system the actual Kafka clients for running on Kubernetes. Um, and the problem with that is, in a, in a sense, you can scale up the clients really easily, um, but you have to keep, keep track also of whether the um, Kafka itself and Cassandra are scaled suitably. Um, things to watch out for, yeah, there's a whole bunch of not things, including um, trying to optimize things across multiple stacks when you've got Kubernetes as part of, part of it. Uh, some monitoring stuff, Prometheus and Grafana. Um, Prometheus is for monitoring and alerting. Grafana is for graphing 
Uh, it's got instrumentation to expose application metrics, lots of different types of time series data visualization, and I've used it um, extensively to monitor all of the applications I've built uh, for performance tuning um, and optimization and just detecting any issues that, that might pop up. Um, yeah, configuring Prometheus with Kubernetes was tricky at one point, so there's actually a Prometheus operator which makes that pretty straightforward. Um, so it's open tracing, open tele telemetry, and some GUIs. So open tracing is end-to-end -end distributed tracing. It gives you end-to-end -end distributed application visibility uh, using traces and then spans for the individual parts that are involved in a trace. It gives you a visualization of system topologies and time spent in each of the systems. Um, so originally I was using open tracing and, and Jager for this. That required manual instrumentation, which is painful and you have to keep it maintained. So what's new, open telemetry is the new standard for tracing metrics and logs, so it combines a whole different thing, a lot of different things. It's got automatic instrumentation, at least for Java, and lots of open source visualization tools. Uh, and I think, as far as I understand it, it's going to be actually used for the new client monitoring kit in the capital as well. So it'll be even more tightly integrated at that point. Here's an example of one of the GUI tools I tried recently, Signals. So that actually gives you a, sort of a pretty nice view of what the system is doing and all the different components that are involved in it. Uh, Postgres is a database. Uh, it's a powerful SQL database. It's SQL plus objects. It's highly extensible and it gives you the ability to store JSON and index JSON data types really easily as well. Um, scalability is limited, it's primarily designed for vertical scaling. Um, again, it's got a vector search like lots of other technologies. Uh, it runs pretty fast on NetApp Azure files apparently. Um, yeah. uh, Superset, this is another Apache project. Who's used Superset before? Yep, quite a few people. So none of this would be new, I suspect, to most people. It's a very powerful data visualization tool that reads from SQL sources. It's got lots of visualization graph types, including geospatial. Um, and I've used it to visualize the title data um, with, in conjunction with Postgres and JSON. So that works pretty well. I, 2122 open search dashboard. Um, so this is the open source version of Elasticsearch. It's based on Lucene. Um, yeah, it's great for ingesting data, indexing, and searching of JSON documents. It's got the inbuilt dashboard for visualization. Um, and I used it as one of the sync systems for my data pipeline example. Um, watch out, the, the default mappings and ingestion may not work <coughs> for all, all data types. I had problems with geospatial data. Um, and also the performance can be problematic, particularly in conjunction with using the CAF to connect sync connectors. Uh, it's quite hard to get the throughput to the level where I was expecting them to be. 23 is Redis. It's a fast in-memory data structure server. It's, really, it's sort of hard to understand what Redis is for. It seems pretty simple at one level. But it's got lots of data types. Um, it's also a pub subsystem as well. Um, and you can actually use some of the Redis, and some of the, the Redis clients give you client-side caching. It gives you ultra-low latency as well, which is quite clever. Um, yeah, it's often used as a cache to reduce the load on the back end, but from our experience, it doesn't actually necessarily help with reducing the latency. So just watch out for that. Um, uh, so yeah, the main thing on the Redis landscape is the license change. So it's, it's now not open source, basically. It's a fork you can use. Ubis Cadence, number 24, and I've got five minutes to go. All right, <laughs> okay. I'm getting there, don't worry. <coughs> uh, it's scalable code as a workflow engine. Um, now, people have probably come across other projects like Apache Airflow, so this is actually quite a different technology in the same space. It gives um, the ability to run code as a uh, sequence state for long-running scheduled steps. It's scalable and reliable, reliable using event sourcing. That means the workflows are fail-proof and history is replayed until the point of failure and resumed. So there's a lot going on under the hood that you don't need to worry about as a developer. The application I built recently using it is a drone delivery application. It combined um, Kafka microservices with um, order and drone uh, workflows. So that was quite, quite clever at combining essentially fast and slow systems into the one integrated environment. Uh, it uses Apache Cassandra and OpenSearch um, behind the scenes. Um, you have to watch out. The code must be deterministic, though, and 
because the code is replayed on failure, it has to produce the same result each time. So there's a lot of potential use cases, including scalable push notifications, which is something Uber uses it for, and potentially for running machine learning uh, workflows as well. 25 Debezian, uh, this is a change data capture system, um, captures database state changes and turns them into Kafka events. So it uses Kafka Connect, or some, in some cases, specific um, database connectors. Uh, it's good for replicating databases or sending database changes to different downstream systems as well. Um, yeah, there's a few things to watch out for. It, it's tricky to set up and run, so use your um, open source service provider, ideally. Carapace, number 26. Uh, this is an open source Kafka schema registry. It adds schemas to, by default anyway, schemaless Kafka. Supports Avro Protobuf and JSON schemas. The Kafka cluster is not directly involved. Carapace enforces the schema checks for the client only. And a typical use case is actually in conjunction with the Debezium as well. Uh, it's, schema stuff is tricky. I'm a computer scientist and I still don't understand it and can't use it, um, basically. So there's, there's a whole lot of things to watch out for. Uh, schema compati compatibility and evolution is, is tricky and Carapace will handle that for you, but it, yeah, you still need to understand the nature of your schema evolutions. Uh, FerretDB is perhaps a slightly odd one out. It's actually an open source MongoDB proxy for Postgres. Uh, so it's compatible with MongoDB on the, yep, quite funny, isn't it? Yes. Uh, MongoDB drivers on the front end, and you can plug in Postgres at the back end, and increasingly, I think, uh, other databases as well. So, and, it's, and it's pretty fast as well. Oh, we're getting there, 28, rising wave. Uh, this is a stream processing database um, available as a service from the company that invented it. Uh, it gives you stateful stream processing using cloud native storage. So this is their sort of super source, super um, magic that makes it happen. Um, and it's potentially a replacement for Kafka streams and it does work um, as a replacement. I've tried it out. Um, and because it's SQL, you can actually um, run Apache Superset on it and visualize your streaming data. So that's quite cool. Um, my use case is last Christmas I built sort of a toy application to do matching over toys and boxes to help Santa get his elves to get things organised and that worked pretty well. Um, it is SQL, which is not Kafka Streams DSL. Uh, there's a few things to watch out for. The Kafka keys are not propagated into Rising Wave um, and yeah, windowing has different semantics, which is a typical problem across all of these stream processing technologies. The final one is TensorFlow number 29. This is a neural network machine learning library. It supports incremental machine learning from streaming Kafka data. So what did I do with it? I plugged it into my drone uh, delivery application and started to do some machine learning across the Kafka streams. And that seemed to work, sort of. You have to watch out for things. Machine learning over streaming spatio-temporal data with concept drifts is tricky. Um, there's time-space bias. You get model accuracy oscillation. Um, and when there's a concept shift in the data, the, the model has, has problems initially um, understanding what's going on and, and is typically worse than even just guessing, which is a problem. One, one idea I have for solving this is, um, yeah, so watch out for machine learning. It's maybe worse than a human. Um, you can use it to train, train and use multiple models concurrently is, is, is my hint of something that could be worth investigating. Have I got any time? Have we got a minute? <laughs> okay, I'll quickly go through a couple of examples. I got this from our internal team. This is our customer-facing face, monitoring architecture. We monitor all our clusters, put the data into Cassandra, and then allow our customers to do queries against Cassandra metrics uh, that work for a while. As we, we got more and more clusters and more customers, we had to change the architecture. So essentially, we were getting too much load on the Cassandra cluster. Uh, we introduced Kafka and Kafka Streams and Redis. Uh, the Redis, is, Redis has been used as a cache in front of Cassandra. So so clients are essentially hitting the Redis cache before having hit the Cassandra cluster. Um, potentially for my drone delivery application, I was thinking of other technologies I can, could include in the future. This is what it is at the moment. But I was thinking, well, I can actually add open telemetry. Um, I can add uh, potentially connecting it up with Kafka to Postgres to allow maybe some of the drone operators to be able to visualize the data about drones and where they are and things using Superset. I could use Redis as a cache to allow customers to do things like order tracking without having to hit the, the main source of data. So there's a few, few ideas. Um, 
And that's it. So I think I've got through the 29 technologies, maybe in, in the right time. <clears throat>